This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode 39 for July 5th, 2009. Hello, everybody. It's Vincent Racaniello. It's a Sunday, and as I was traveling last week, I wasn't able to record TWIV at the usual time. Dick de Palmier is still traveling, and this weekend, Alan Dove is moving, so he wasn't available. So it's just me. And what I decided to do is give you a little bit of myself and Dick talking about basic virology. This is an idea we thought of some time ago. We thought we would have small segments, 10 to 15 minute segments in TWIV episodes where we discuss fundamental concepts about viruses. Maybe you could call it Virology 101. So we recorded one on virus structure just a few weeks ago, and I'm going to play that for you now. So it's me and Dick talking about virus structure. And when that's done, we'll come back and I'll do some reader emails and give you some picks of the week. So I'll see you on the other side of virus structure. Now, we've always wanted to have some basic episodes right. uh, or sessions on virology. Right. Just to bring me up to speed, I presume. In the old way, with Dick and I, as we started TWIV, it was just you and I. Yep. Let's talk about some fundamental aspects, and I'll sure. be the professor, and you can All ask right. questions. And yep. the first aspect that we should touch on, which is very important and really influences all other aspects of virology, is structure. What do viruses look like? Yeah. How do we know what they look like? I'm not supposed to ask the question. Oh, yeah, we could ask because I know some of these answers. But <laughs> Now, as you know, Dick, I give uh, several courses on, on viruses. I do know this, and I should have taken all of them. And I feel guilty about that. In my <laughs> course, uh, this is the structure lecture is actually uh, the third lecture. Mm -hmm. I have others, a few others to begin with. But the first slide of the structure lecture shows a house designed by Walter Gropius. Oh, Interesting. Now, why do you think I would start off a virus structure lecture with Walter Gropius? Well, you'd have to look at his house to find out the answer. <laughs> because he said something which is very relevant. He said, in order to create something that functions properly, a container, a chair, a house, its essence has to be explored for it should serve its purpose to perfection, i.e. it should be durable, inexpensive, and beautiful. Wow. Do you know what that school was called? The Form Follows Function, function. School. You bet. And viruses are yeah. built as Walter Gropius would build them. Right. Perfect. Was he, was he part of the Bauhaus movement? He was. He was. Well, there you go. See? And viruses, by definition, are part of the Bauhaus movement. So virus <laughs> structures are apparently very diverse, but they can be simplified. Mm -hmm. We like to simplify things. It's called the reductionist approach. Exactly. Right? It is. The most simple viruses are those, structurally, are those that infect plants. In fact, remember the first virus ever discovered? Tobacco mosaic. Tobacco mosaic right. virus. It's right. nothing but an RNA wrapped in protein. Right. It's a single RNA and a single protein which binds to the RNA and is repeated. It coats this protein, this RNA. Right. This is called helical symmetry. So these genomes are called, they say they have helical symmetry, one protein coating the genome, and that's all that tobacco mosaic virus is. It's amazing. It's a piece of RNA coated with protein. Are there other viruses like tobacco mosaic in that they're helically wound around either DNA or an RNA? Is there a family of uh, tobacco mosaic virus-like viruses? Yes, there are, there are other similar viruses in, in plants, but you know, there are no similar viruses of animals. So there are viruses whose genomes are coded in protein and form a nucleocapsid just like TMV. But it's not naked. TMV is a naked nucleocapsid, as we call it. Right. Sendai virus, which is a paramyxovirus. Rabies virus. They both have genomes wrapped in protein, as is the TMV genome. Okay. But they also have an envelope around them. Right. So we think this is because in a, getting from host to host... Needs, we need to protect the RNA. You know, the TMV is probably brought from plant to plant by mechanical means, farm equipment, farmers, maybe insects. Insects, lots of insect vectors. And they're probably protected, but the animal viruses are not. 
So the envelope comes from the animal host cell? Yes, it does. Aha. And when we get to that step of the replicative cycle, you'll see exactly how it gets there. But it comes from the host cell. Neat. So you can think of rabies virus as tobacco mosaic virus with a membrane envelope. What about uh, bacteriophage? No envelopes? Some don't, but some do. Some actually have lipid components. Really? Yeah. Not like animal viruses because hmm. they don't have that kind of a membrane, but they do right. have lipid components. Right. So this brings us to the second general class of virions, those that have envelopes. Aha. Uh -huh. And they're all, as you said, they're all derived from the host cell. Hmm. Now, an envelope is, is our name for a, a lipid bilayer. Mm -hmm. And in that lipid membrane, there are proteins. Right. So the famous HA and NA of influenza yep. are stuck in its envelope. So influenza is, is an envelope virus. Yeah. It has ribonuclear proteins very similar to the ones we've talked about for TMV, except they're in pieces. They're segmented. Right. So for influenza, there are eight such pieces in an envelope. Now, of course, an envelope, an, a lipid membrane by itself doesn't have a lot of rigidity. Right. So most of these viruses with membrane envelopes have uh, below the envelope a viral protein that gives it some kind of structure. So right. influenza viruses have an M protein. Rabies viruses have another protein under there. Retroviruses have a protein because an envelope itself is not enough. Right. But if you took away the virus component from the envelope and put an antigen inside, you'd have a liposome. Yes, that's correct. Which is a way to deliver... Sure, antigens sure. to cells that make antibodies. Absolutely. And as we'll see later, you can make uh, particles sometimes just by expressing in cells that protein that we've been talking about that gives the envelope rigidity. Right. So did we invent liposomes based on our knowledge of viruses? I don't know the answer to that. Because if I were studying viruses, I, that would have occurred to me. You know, when you break open cells, you get vesicles also sure. called microsomes. Yep. So that may have been part of the inspiration. But okay. it could be that viruses, you know, little packages of antigens, basically, right. inspired it. So another question that I have, based on this knowledge, is that can you create your own virus by creating a liposome around any viral genome? Take two dissimilar parts, assemble them together, and mm -hmm. make a new virus as a result. I don't know if you could get the genome in there. Yes, you could. So we know, for example, you can express... The, what's called the gag protein of retroviruses, only the gag protein in cells, and you will get um, lipid enveloped particles butt off the cell. Huh. So if you could find a way to get something inside them, right? You know, retroviruses have signals on their genomes so that they're put into the particles. So you can take those signals and put them on another sequence and get it into the particle, yes. What about infecting the same cell with three different viruses? You and all have envelopes. Sure. Do they exchange? Does each one has a, have a unique envelope, or do they all have generic envelopes? Well, if you infected with three different influenza viruses, they would exchange their no, I, I didn't mean, I mean... Different in, viruses? Yeah, completely you know, different viruses. No, that doesn't viruses. happen. There's some incompatibility. Ah. Even if you could get a cell that would be infected by all three, you would not get new viruses out. There are many problems. Part of the problem is that they would interfere with each other in replication. Okay. And then the packaging mechanisms, okay. that is the way to get the genome into the viral capsid. We'll get to that, I'm sure. Is uh, not compatible among right. viruses. I just wondered how generic this whole concept was. Now, I'm using a term called capsid, yep. which we haven't defined. Nope. Do you know what a capsid is, Dick? I do, actually, because I have had a basic course in this some time ago, but uh, why Cap don't you capsid refresh my is memory? the protein shell that surrounds the genome. Right. That is encoded for by the virus itself. Right. Now, influenza virus technically doesn't have a capsid. It has a nucleocapsid, which is the RNA plus the protein. But the whole virus has an envelope. Right. And when it has an envelope, you don't use the word capsid. Uh -huh. So let's talk about the third type of structure. Okay. Just a protein shell, which is a capsid, like poliovirus. Right. It has a protein shell, and inside it is the RNA. Right. Many viruses are built this way, and they're built on the principles of icosahedral symmetry. <laughs> and all that means, you know the geometric shape that's an icosahedron? I do. You know? I'm a big fan of Buckminster Fuller. <laughs> I presume he would have been a virologist had he not been a designer. <laughs> an icosahedron, of course, is a solid with 20 faces, each of which is an equilateral triangle. In fact, most viruses, which are made of pure protein, are built with icosahedral symmetry. That's amazing. No other kind of symmetry. And we think it is because it's the best way to build a shell with the fewest number of components. And right. that's what a virus wants. They want genetic economy. Sure. 
So they build these nice shells with icosahedral symmetry. Is that a self-assembling unit? They are self-assembling. In most cases, some of the more complex viruses need some help, chaperones and so forth, to help assemble. But for the smaller viruses like polio, SV40, if you express the proteins, they will assemble into shells. Wow. Polio, rotaviruses, hmm. are all vi exam adenoviruses, SV40 polyomaviruses. Uh, these are all viruses made up of just a shell, and the shell or capsid, and it's made with it's built with icosahedral symmetry. Now, there's another kind of structure where you take a capsid and then you put a lipid envelope around it. Uh -huh. And now the capsid is actually technically a nucleocapsid because it mm -hmm. just surrounds the genome and you've got another structure on the outside. It's a little bit technical, but right. just so that you know what these terms mean. Right. And yellow fever virus is an example of that. The flaviovirus group. Flaviviruses, alpha viruses, all the toga viruses are icosahedral with an envelope around the outside. Interesting. So influenza viruses have an envelope, but the genome is, is helical nucleocapsid. And then we have a whole set of viruses with envelopes that have icosahedral nucleocapsids. Huh. Herpes viruses have an icosahedral nucleocapsid and an envelope on the outside. Vince, what's between the lipid bilayer outer coating, this uh, lipid layer, and the icosahedral? Is there any... Fluid or material in between? In some cases, there there is material. So for the simpler viruses like yellow fever, the viral glycoproteins that are embedded in the membrane mm -hmm. actually pass through the space between the membrane and the capsid, and they touch the capsid. Ah, their interactions. For larger viruses like herpes viruses, mm -hmm. that space is actually filled with protein. It's called the tegument. And they're actually so like very. A worm. <laughs> I don't know what the word means, Zach. You know what I know word? it. Sure, of course, I deal with it all the time. It's used in worm biology and it, in insects also. The anyway, exoskeleton is referred to as a tegument. So it uh, has many important proteins, some of which are transcriptional activators. When the virus infects a cell, these proteins go in the nucleus and stimulate the transcription of viral genes. Wow. Because they couldn't be transcribed otherwise, because the cell can't do it. <laughs> So, yes, so in some cases there are proteins in there. And uh, Mimi virus is an example of a icosahedral virus. It just happens to be very big. Very big. Without an envelope. But it does have these funny hairs on the surface or protrusions. They're quite long. We talked about it once before. It's basically an icosahedral capsid with these protrusions coating it. It's almost as if, as if you took uh, a ball and had uh, worms sticking out all around it. It surrounds <laughs> right. it. Uh, we don't know what they're there for. What does amoebae virus infect, by the way? Amoebae. Ah. Oh, yeah, that's right. We've talked about Proteus vulgaris. That's right. Yeah, the amoebae in water towers uh, and, yeah, and yeah. lakes and so forth. Wow. It may infect us. Some people think it causes hmm. pneumonia, but we're not sure. Then the last type of structure. See, we only have a handful are what we call complex viruses because we really don't understand them. <laughs> and those are the pox viruses. Oh. They're not icosahedral. They're very big. They're not, they have a membrane. It's a very complex membrane. Mm -hmm. But it's not a membrane around an icosahedral nucleocapsid. It's not a membrane around a nucleocapsid, a helical nucleocapsid, as we described. What's inside is very complicated. Mm. And we'll have to show a picture. Hmm. And so we should say that we'll have some pictures of these viruses online oh, yeah. to go along with this, right? Sure. And you can go. We'll have an example of tobacco mosaic virus, the heliconucleocapsid. We'll have an example of enveloped nucleocapsid viruses like flu. We'll have icosahedral viruses, enveloped icosahedral viruses, and pox viruses. And they're very pretty when you see a lot of them together clumped up and sort of crystallized under the electron microscope with negative staining. Very beautiful. I've, I've seen them. Uh, Vince, I have a question also, and that is, um, has anybody lined up the viruses that are most widely known in terms of on one side of a page, here's the shape of the virus. In the middle, here's the um, sequence for the genome. And on the right-hand side, here are the number of proteins encoded for, and here are their sequences and their structures. Has anybody ever put that all together in one page so that you can get the complete physical story of a virus just by looking? That would be a big picture. It certainly would. <laughs> well, some of these viruses don't produce that many proteins, do they? Some of them are small. Like um, what's, the, what's the minimum number of proteins produced by a virus? You told me one. One. Once. Yeah, that's it. Well, here, I have a picture from our textbook. Okay. It's not everything you asked for, but it's 
Close enough. Let's have a look at that. See if that starts. Uh, it starts my mind to working. How's that? Isn't it true that the way you assemble information visually can be very important? In fact, that would lead me into my... <laughs> That's right. In fact, I brought a book over for you, Vince, that actually helps you do that. And uh, it's called Visual Explanations by Edward Tuft. And in fact, he has uh, four of these books. I just brought you one of them because I brought an extra copy. Uh, the first book he ever wrote was called Envisioning Information. And... Uh, how you envision information. I think we've gotten spectacularly good at this in molecular biology. And, you know, I think of things in terms of uh, these DNA chips and looking at the arrays and the expression of gene patterns as mountains mm -hmm. and valleys. Mm -hmm. uh, sure. we're, we're extremely visual in terms of our ability to learn things. Our optic lobes are bigger than any other part of our brains in terms of receiving information, which is why pictures speak so much louder than words. And in fact, that's why I, in my early career, I was an electromicroscopist. I enjoyed looking at things under the electron microscope. And certainly viruses are great to look at, I think. Do you know when the first virus pictures were made by EM? Um, my guess is back in the 50s, but I don't know. Because um, I'm thinking of the, uh, the history of the electron microscope. In 1940, Helmut Rufka. Really? 40? 1940. Wow. First pictures of virus wow. particles, bacteriophages. 1940. Yes. It was the beginning, and we have lots of pictures of various viruses. Yeah, they're fantastic particles. pictures. They're fantastic. Aren't they? And now, of course, we can do uh, structural determinations exactly. and get even more beautiful pictures. And chemistry, too. It's fabulous. Virus structure is, is a huge field. Uh, I was just on a study section, a virology study section last week. Yes. And the number of applications to do structure is amazing. No kidding. X ray crystallography, nuclear magnetic resonance. Sure. And cryo electron microscopy. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That. I've done that, actually. Which is where you freeze a virus, yeah, 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 yeah. and then you take pictures. You take many, many pictures, and it's basically like a CAT scan, yeah. and then you take all the pictures and assemble them by computer. That's getting even more powerful. The resolution is and getting... you can make three-dimensional models. You make three-dimensional models. That's right. So what you do, Dick, is you place virus particles on a grid, and you freeze them, and you take hundreds of pictures, the assumption being that you're going to get every possible orientation, right. That's right. and then a computer assembles <laughs> them into a three-dimensional object. Cool. That's very so cool. in a person, when you take a CAT scan, the, the imager rotates around the person. Yeah. But here, the virus is rotating on the grid. and that's, that's Isn't that right. fabulous? It's the best. So that's virus structure. So any other questions about virus structure before we end this session? Um, gee, Vince, I think you've covered everything I would have asked. All right, there'll be a quiz those. next week. Great, I won't be here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm auditing this course, I want you to know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's it for virus structure. That's great. This episode of TWIV is sponsored by GoToMyPC.com. More people are web commuting by accessing their office PCs from home, and that's because people love working remotely. I certainly do. I try to do it as much as I can. That's why I recommend GoToMyPC. It's brought to you by Citrix, and it's the best way to web commute. GoToMyPC is the easiest remote access service on the market. You simply log on to GoToMyPC.com and your office desktop instantly appears. You can use any program, work on any file, check your email, even access your network resources. Use GoToMyPC to work from home even one day a week. You'll spend less time in rush hour traffic and more time being productive. Now you can try GoToMyPC free. 30 days, but you must visit gotomypc.com slash podcast. That's gotomypc.com slash podcast for a free 30-day trial. Tell them TWIV sent you. And we thank them for their support of TWIV. It's time for some user email. I hope you enjoyed that session, by the way, of Virology 101, Virus Structure with Dick. Uh, we'll, we'll continue those in the future. And we'll have some material online for you to look at, twiv.tv, that we mentioned uh, in the episode. So here's some reader email. Frank wrote, thanks for the great shows and the others too. If your sound engineer would match the decibels of your intro music to the intro voice, we wouldn't have to learn the earbud jerk to protect our delicate oral areas. I'm very sorry about that. I like loud music. It's my fault. And I... I have toned it down, starting with the previous episode, TWIV 38, so I hope it's okay, Frank. If not, 
let me know. I'll try and fix it again. And then he goes on, skin microecology is being addressed for bacteria, science, 29th May, volume 324. And I have to believe it is at least as rich in viral ecology. Thanks, Frank. Well, what he's referring to is one of several studies where uh, scientists are looking at the nature and number of bacteria on skin surfaces. And that paper that he cited is one of those. So the question is, what is the virus composition on the skin? And in fact, we don't know. It's not been done. I think it's a great question, and it should be looked at. It's not hard to do. We have all the technology to do it. And I suspect it's being done as we speak. So when it comes out, we'll talk about it here on TWIV. That's a good question, Frank. Ricardo wrote, Hello, Vincent. Here's a new book about the role of viruses in evolution, and it's called Virolution. And he sent a link to this. It is an Amazon.com UK link. So this book is not available on the uh, US Amazon site. It's the UK site. It's called Virolution by Frank Ryan. And the subtitle is Viruses' Astonishing Role in the Evolution of Life on Earth. And Frank Ryan is apparently a professor at the University of Sheffield. And he's an expert on evolution. And the purpose of this book, it's written on this website to develop his evolutionary concepts and translate evolutionary science into medicine. So I haven't read it, but uh, and I, I have to try and find it because it's not available on the U.S. Amazon site, but I'll look for it. And uh, in the meantime, may, maybe a uh, reader or a listener would like to check it out. Perhaps someone in the U.K. could get a copy. But if I can get a copy, I'll look at it and let you know. But thanks for that link, Ricardo. A few episodes back, you may remember, we did a whole episode on virus evolution with Luis Villarreal. And the links we gave you in that episode were pretty technical, those virus evolution books. So this looks like more uh, geared to people who don't have great backgrounds on uh, virus evolution. So check that out. And that's from Professor Ricardo. Peter wrote, Dear all, great show again, episode 37. Great guest as usual, although I miss Dick already. Well, I hope... Well, you got you heard some from Dick de Pommier today, so that helps. I don't know exactly when he'll be back, but he always surprises us. Anyway, Peter goes on. There was a longer article in the Boston Globe on June 17th compared to the one of June 16th, which you linked to on your website. And he's referring to the story we did on uh, the contamination of Genzyme's bioreactors with a virus. I'll put that link in the show notes. There they write, last fall, an FDA inspection of the Alston plant found significant deviations from current good manufacturing practice in the manufacture of licensed therapeutic drug products, bulk drug substances, and drug components, according to a warning letter sent to Termier on February 27th. Kelly would not say whether the deviations cited in the letter were related to the latest problem. He uh, referring to Christopher C. Kelly, an FDA spokesman, doesn't have to say this since the FDA posts all warning letters on their website. This particular one can be found at, and he gives the link, which I'll provide. To me, it doesn't look like these deviations have anything to do with the virus contamination. Apparently, the virus got introduced early with each contaminated batch, since the steam sterilization of the bioreactors prior to their use should easily kill the virus. Genzyme suspects a nutrient which would most likely be serum. I guess they still use serum since at least the Cerazyme process is rather old. Cerazyme got approved in 1994, but Favrazyme in 2003. I believe Genzyme grows the, their CHO cells on microcarriers. If it is not a nutrient, it could also be the cell bank. I don't know much about cell bank testing, but if only a few vials of the cell bank were contaminated with the virus, they might not have picked it up during testing as they can test only a few randomly selected vials. I'm wondering if this was it or if we will hear more about this in the future. Good question. If there's anything about it, we'll let you know. We'll pick it up. As for future 12 episode topics, two come to mind. One, testing of cell banks used for production of biopharmaceuticals. And two, viral clearance during the purification of cell culture derived biopharmaceuticals. I guess I am too focused on production of biotherapeutics, though that's how I pay the bills, to quote Alan. That's fine. I think anything having to do with viruses is, is 
good fodder for TWIV, and those are two good suggestions. I'll put them on the list. And we we would love to get some people who work in uh, bio-industry to talk about how things are done, although I understand it may be difficult to talk about proprietary processes. Thanks, Peter, for that. Len wrote, Vince, as per my last email, I have thrown together what I could find on the spring and summer 1918 Spanish influenza outbreaks. There were quite a number of them, if in fact they were all influenza. While this seems likely to have been the case, it would take examining tissue samples to confirm, which means that we may never know for sure. I wonder, however, if any of the military deaths had tissue samples taken and fixed in paraffin. If so, it might be possible to culture the virus from those, which is how they did it with the September 1918 case from South Carolina that first recreated a partial DNA sequence of the virus. Anyway, I will update this as I find more information. I hope you find it useful. So Len provided a list of uh, the known outbreaks of influenza starting in about March, the end of March 1918. That was, of course, at Camp Funston, and then going through April, May, uh, June, July, August, and all the way into the fall. And I'm sure you, the listeners know that the idea is that there was an initial wave of influenza in the, starting in the spring of 1918, followed by a second wave uh, in September. And the idea is that the second wave was ver- much more severe than the first, so it might represent a virus which underwent changes uh, to increase its virulence. And of course, this is what the press focuses on and always tries to say, well, the the current swine flu, the 2009 H1N1 strain is going to do the same thing that the 1918 strain did, and that is become more virulent in a second wave. And I just want to point out there's no evidence, and I think we've mentioned this before on TWIV, there's no evidence that there was a genetic change that caused the second wave in 1918. We don't have virus from the first wave. So as Len says, we don't know if it was even influenza or if it was the the same strain. I don't know if there are samples available to be able to test that hypothesis that it was a mutational event. If there are uh, such samples, then people are certainly going to do the experiment, and that is to recover the virus. What they do is they extract nucleic acids from the samples, which were taken from people who died of influenza. They sequence the viral RNA, and then they assemble it into a complete genome and recover virus from it. They don't actually recover virus from the samples. They're too old to be able to do that, but rather they sequence the nucleic acid. So in order to confirm the hypothesis that their second wave was due to a mutation of the virus that first emerged in the spring, you have to sequence isolates from the spring. And we simply don't have that. So all the speculation is incorrect. There's no data to support it. And if you ever read or hear anywhere in the press uh, anyone saying that the swine flu of this year is going to mutate as it did, as the 1918 strain did, that's wrong because there's no evidence that such mutational events occurred. Anyway, thanks, Len, for providing all of those. He he gave me a list of all the outbreaks, which is great. And uh, he gave me a couple of references. A lot of them were taken from John Barry's book, The Great Influenza, and also from a, a second book, which is from Carol Byerly, Fear, Fever of War from New York University Press. And then finally, he had a document from the Public Health Service, and he writes, the Public Health Service began publishing weekly reports on the prevalence of influenza in the United States. And these reports were compiled into book form and published. And you can get this book online for free, and I'll post the link to that. It's quite interesting. You can see uh, a listing uh, of all the outbreaks uh, put together by the Public Health Service. Enio wrote... Hi, Dr. Racaniello. I just listened to the latest TWIV. Concerning logging into the library using GoToMyPC, it should work fine. In theory, the university network security group would be able to block access, but the implementation to do so would be horrendous. And from my perspective as a professional network security person, would be a bad idea. Of course, you would be using the browser at your office rather than at home. So I had referred to the fact that when I go home, it's hard for me to access... Uh, journals through my library, university library subscription, and he's saying that I could use go to my PC. So I have to try that out. Thanks for that, Enio. 
And then he writes, in relation to Dr. Mim's work, here is another example of amateur scientists working with professional researchers. And he sent a, an article, a link to an article uh, which describes how a amateur scientist, a kitchen sort of science, I suppose, was involved in monitoring uh, space events having to do with the uh, Hubble telescope observation. So I'll put a link for that in the show notes. Thanks very much for that email. Russ wrote, I'm interested in the concept of a super spreader. What is it about this individual that allows for such a significant infection rate? If the virus is not latent, but would normally lyse the cell, causing cell death, then how can these individuals shed virus at such a high titer without showing any overt clinical signs or symptoms of disease? I understand the concept of latency, but what is going on here? Is the concept of a super spreader just incorrectly labeled due to the fact that these people are just more apt to come in contact with a large number of people? Or does this relate to the host's immune response to the infection? Could these individuals have immune deficiency that would allow virus particles to be produced without eliciting a cell-mediated response? Also, I would like to ask what role does the complement system, if any, play in virus infections? Love the show. P.S. Come on, Vince. The mind is the first thing to go in old age. It's .com, not .org. He's referring to DoveDocs.com, although I don't think Alan will mind too much about the publicity. Okay, Russ, you're, you got it right. It doesn't really have to do with the individual shedding virus any more than anyone else. And it doesn't even have to do with an individual that does not have symptoms. It simply has to do uh, with the epidemiology of the situation. As you said, they're probably more apt to come into contact with a large number of people. And let me quote from a clinical virology textbook, super spreaders. In a number of these instances, it is the overall epidemiological context rather than the nature of the individual index patient that is crucial to super-spreading events. So in other words, the, the patients who are super-spreaders are simply in a position to spread virus more effectively, perhaps because they're in a hospital setting where they can contact many people, healthcare workers, other patients, and so forth. It depends, of course, on the individual infection. But the SARS ap outbreak was characterized by super-spreaders who just happened to be in the right place to spread infection to a lot of people. It's not that they were making virus without symptoms. It's not that they were making more virus. It had to do with the epidemiological setting. Swiss Compass wrote, uh, he sent a link to an article about H1N1 virus with the interesting use of computer uh, analogies. And this is from Bunny's blog, uh, where he compares computer computers with viruses. Swiss Compass summarized some of these analogies. DNA would be like the program stored on disk. RNA is the program loaded in RAM. Amino acid is a pixel in a frame buffer. Protein is the image output from the RNA program. The organism is a computer with an IP address. And a functional group of cells is an application which listens to a particular socket. So for those of you who or computer savvy, you could check out that uh, blog post, which is quite amusing. I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Thanks for that, Swiss Compass. Ben wrote, Hi Twiv, if swine flu is mild at this point, why aren't there people who are trying to get it now so that they won't be susceptible in case there is a more lethal wave? I can't imagine anyone advising intentional infection, but it's not immediately obvious to me why it wouldn't be worth the risk from an individual's perspective. Right now, the risk of death isn't much beyond the seasonal flu, so while of course an infection could be very unpleasant, that seems better than risking infection if H1N1 becomes more lethal. Please explain the flaws in the above reasoning. Is it mistaken to think that getting H1N1 now would confer immunity to future mutation? Anyway, enough weird questions. I love the show. I'm just a student at a community college transferring to RIT's bioinformatics program in the fall. So some of the more technical bits are beyond me, but I really enjoy being challenged with new concepts. It's really nice to have an entertaining, well-produced show that really gets into the science that isn't just another podcast of course lectures. 
uh, the flaws in your reasoning. First of all, there's no reason to think that H, the current H1N1 strain will get more virulent in the fall. Uh, we don't have any previous data to support that idea. And as I talked about earlier, there's no evidence from 1918 that that's what happened. Uh, in general, you don't want to become infected in, uh, with anything because you don't know if you're one of the individuals who will respond poorly to the infection. Perhaps you're subtly immunosuppressed and it might be very lethal in you. So while if you get flu with the H1N1 strain, you're likely to be immune to, say, more serious disease in the fall, I wouldn't at all advocate doing it intentionally. But if you get infected, I don't think the virus would change sufficiently by the fall uh, such that your immunity wouldn't be effective. In fact, just last week, I have reason to believe that my older son uh, contracted influenza. He had the perfect symptoms. I didn't have him. Uh, I didn't have any diagnostics done. We were uh, away and I couldn't take a, a, a sample to check myself, but I would suspect that in the fall, he's not going to become ill if and when the virus returns. Of course, he'll also have the vaccine that's available, so it'll be hard to test it anyway. So basically, I wouldn't advise getting infected because you never know how you're going to respond. It could be worse than you think. Now, it's great that you're going into bioinformatics, and I think it's good that you listen to TWIV because if you're going to, even if you're great at computing, I think you need to have a good understanding of biology. The best bioinformaticians understand the biology. So we try and make virology accessible here on TWIV. I know it's sometimes difficult, but my philosophy is if you listen, you'll absorb and if you keep doing it over and over, you'll get it. And, of course, you can always ask us questions if you don't understand something. So look at this as your virology course, an ongoing course where you can get as much uh, interactivity as you need. John wrote, Dear Dr. Racaniello, I want to thank you and Dr. Depommier very much for starting the TWIV podcast. I enjoy the content and approach you take to sharing your passion and information on virology. Your podcast is very informative and has fueled my curiosity on this topic. I found TWIV back in March of this year while searching the internet for information on virology, which is a hobby of mine. I went back to episode one to start listening and have just caught up to the current episode. I think it's great how people are continuing to find TWIV. Our, our listenership grows, and I suspect, of course, the current influenza pandemic has something to do with it, but many people are interested in virology. So welcome to TWIV and I hope you continue to, to learn a lot. Now for his questions. One view that you have shared is viruses are not alive, which I would agree with based on my limited understanding. You have also used the term live virus vaccine. I assume it implies the genetic material of the virus is still present. I'm curious, if viruses are not alive, why is the term live virus vaccine used? Well, John, in fact, it's an error because... What we mean to say is an infectious virus vaccine. So in other words, the virus in the vaccine preparation is able to initiate an infectious cycle, as opposed to an inactivated vaccine where the virus does not replicate. It's just a name that has came into the field years ago and has stuck. So every time I say it, it's from habit. I should say infectious virus vaccine, which is a little more cumbersome. But there are some people who believe viruses are living or at least on the border of being alive. So perhaps they coined the term originally. There's a question for you. Who made the first live virus vaccine or infectious virus vaccine? We've talked about it here on TWIV. Also, one topic you have covered in a few episodes is vaccines and their safety. I agree with your assertion that vaccines are safe, at least the active component, but I have not heard you comment on what I believe is the real source of concern in the public, which are the preservatives and other compounds used in manufacturing vaccines. For example, I have read stories linking thimerosal to autism, and I have found many references in the media on similar topics trying to stir up concern around these substances. I was wondering if there have been any credible studies on these components of vaccines. Well, John, we last week on episode 38... Uh, Glenn Rawl talked a bit about this. I would suggest that you go back and listen to that episode. And also, we have posted in the past episodes of different podcasts. And the one that comes to mind is uh, Ginger Campbell's 
Brain Science podcast where she did an interview with Paul Offit. He talked beautifully on what studies have been done, what epidemiological studies have been done to rule out the effects of any components, I should say, in vaccines. So the ruling out of thimerosal or any other compounds with respect to autism. Also, uh, Mark Chrislip has podcasted about this as well. And I'll put links to these two episodes in the show notes because I think that instead of me repeating everything, you should listen to them. They did a great job in explaining the fact that a lot of epidemiological studies have been done and none of them have shown any connection with any component of virus vaccines and the induction of autism. Another question I have relates to listener emails requesting information on good undergraduate books and programs. While you have mentioned a couple of books, I did not come across any recommendations for undergraduate programs. For instance, what type of undergraduate degree would be the best basis for a career in virology, and which schools would be good to attend for an undergraduate degree leading to a graduate program in virology? Well, I always feel that chemistry is a great major for anyone that wants to go into a science like virology because you really get to understand the building blocks of viruses. So you could do chemistry as an undergraduate. I don't know if, if you can major in biochemistry. That would be good also. Those would be my first recommendations. Of course, I majored in biology as an undergraduate, which clearly served me well, so you could do that as well. But I really feel that if I had done a minor in chemistry or biochemistry, I would have been even better in terms of research. Now, as, as far as what undergraduate institutions to go to, that's a tough one. And, you know, I don't spend a lot of time checking out other undergraduate institutions. I happen to know that Columbia, where I work, has a great chemistry program. So that would be a great place to go. But there are plenty of other really good schools. My feeling is any school that will give you a great education in chemistry or biochemistry and biology, but would also give you the opportunity to have excellent classes in other areas would be the place to go. So the best school that you can afford. And then he continues, it's probably a little late for me to start a second career in virology. Probably no one would hire a 60-year-old postdoc, but I do spend my time reading as much as I can to learn on my own since I am fascinated by viruses. I have used the open courseware material from MIT and I'm wondering if you could recommend other materials that are openly available. I'm building up a base of knowledge so that I can understand more of your podcast one day, and I can read your book and have a reasonable level of understanding. Well, I don't know of any open courseware relating to virology, but listeners, if you know something, let us know, and we'll uh, I'll mention it on the show for John. I do think that TWIV is filling a need in this area. I'm trying to make TWIV an educational resource, but one that's fun. So it's a conversation. And of course, today it's just me mostly. This is not what I want TWIV to be typically. I think if you make it learning fun, then it's much easier for people to do that. So I'm, And I have great future plans for TWIV in this respect. I have plans to continue it a long time and to expand the types of things that we do. So I'm hoping it will be the place to go online to learn about viruses. And then he says, you have mentioned you are curious about the background of your listeners. I received my BS degree in chemistry, mostly inorganic coursework, but have spent the past 30 plus years in the software industry. At the time I left college, the software industry paid better and there were many more opportunities. I've always been interested and fascinated by viruses and spend my leisure time learning as much as I can. Well, see, you have a BS in chemistry. You're in perfect position to go to graduate school in, in virology, of course, uh, at, at this point in your career, you probably don't want to do that. Lastly, you mentioned in a recent episode that you had ideas for science applications for the iPod iPhone. I spend time developing software for my own interests and have recently started working on the iPhone as a development platform just to learn and understand how it works. Since my background and day job are in software development, I have a lot of experience in this field and I would be happy to collaborate with you on developing any applications you're interested in. I apologize for so many questions, but I'm curious by nature. Thank you again for providing this service. Don't apologize for questions. That's what we love here at TWIV. Uh, I have ideas about using the iPod iPhone to teach viruses to people, and I want to somehow link it into TWIV in my blog, and I have specific ideas for using that platform to teach people about viruses. So I'll get in touch with you, John. Now we're back at, at Swiss Compass again, who writes, 
I recently got corrected when relating the tale of the unusual wasp virus symbiosis discussed on TWIV21, Viruses of Bacteria, and thought I would forward the correction to you guys. So he's referring to an episode where we talked about the wasp virus, the parasitic wasp that injects a virus genome along with its eggs into a caterpillar. You talked about Manduca sexta, the caterpillar that develops into a moth. Its primary food is the tobacco plant, so it is called the tobacco hornworm, a pest. As Manduca sexta begins to eat the tobacco plant, the tobacco plant becomes injured. It then is stimulated to secrete pheromones, pheromones that are similar to the parasitic wasp's mating pheromone. The parasitic wasp is called in by the injured plant and spies this caterpillar eating away on the tobacco plant and then infects the caterpillar with these virus-laden larvae. A remarkable story as the plant has no need for insect pheromones except under these conditions. Corrections I got. Chemicals sent to communicate within species are pheromones. Between species are chiromones, K-A-I-R-O mones. The chiromones don't resemble sex pheromones of the wasps. In fact, the wasps have to learn to associate the chiromones with their host's scent specifically before they'll be attracted to it. It is still contentious whether the plants evolved to call the wasps or whether the wasps adapted to use the chemicals the plant already gave off in response to herbivory or herbivory. Love the show. Thanks for those corrections. And I know we didn't cover all the details as you put them there, but now our listeners know the whole story. Uh, Zach wrote... If you want to get TWIV into high schools, here's an idea. Find a school that is doing something about virology and AP bio and invite the students to submit questions in audio format. Astronomy Cast did a few shows like this, and I think it worked pretty well. I guess you probably can find an AP bio class by putting a shout-out on Twitter and on the show. So that's a great idea. I want to get some high school students to send in questions to involve a younger crowd, and this was suggested by Jim. Uh, last episode, uh, or two episodes ago. And so any high school students listening or teachers, send in your audio comments. Uh, you'll, we'll tell you later how you can do that. And I will put some tweets out about that as well. My son, my older son, is going to high school in September, and I hope to get him uh, involved in, in some of his science classes and teachers as well. Because I think it would be great to have students asking questions. And my view eventually is to have some of them on the show. So that's a great idea, Zach. Andrew wrote, didn't you guys talk about this a month or so ago? And he gave us a link to an article on Dvorak.org slash blog. And the article is bemoaning about mainstream media not picking up a story uh, about someone who is cured of AIDS. And a number of episodes ago, we talked about this case where uh, an individual in Germany received a bone marrow transplant, and the lymphocytes came from an individual, the bone marrow cells, excuse me, came from an individual who had a, has a mutation in uh, a co-receptor for the virus, and therefore this individual received uh, all a new bone marrow and consequently lymphocytes that are resistant to infection. The article at Dvorak.org is saying, why hasn't this been covered in the the popular press? And they asked a scientist why he thought this was the case. And he said, I'm not sure. Maybe it's because a doctor came up with the cure and not a research scientist. And this is totally ridiculous. And here, let me quote him. My guess is that most scientific researchers are somewhat stunned that a clinician, not a research scientist, has been able to come up with the cure. Most of the big money and big name American institutions are somewhat embarrassed to acknowledge that the very first case of HIV cure is not coming from their institutions. Pure speculation, many clinicians make important research advances in all aspects of science, including virology and HIV AIDS. It was covered extensively in the press. The New York Times had a, had a story on it. Most of the major newspapers carried this story. So this is just nonsense. It was covered, and we talked about it on TWIV. I know we're not mainstream media, but Dvorak, you should listen to TWIV. Anyway, thanks, uh, Andrew, for pointing that out. And that brings us to the end of email. 
And let's do our science picks of the week. Well, Dick gave you his pick, a book called Visual Explanations, Images and Quantities, Evidence and Narrative. It's by Edward Tuft, T-U-F-T-E. And it's he. this individual has written several books on displaying information. He has another one, uh, which is perhaps better known. It's called The Visual Display of Quantitative Information. And it's basically his explanation on how you display data. What are the best ways to do it? He's the master of visualization. Okay, So that's Visual Explanations by Edward Tuft. And my pick of the week is also a book. And this is a book by an individual that we've picked before here on TWIV. It's a book called The Youngest Science, Notes of a Medicine Watcher, and the author is Lewis Thomas. And of course, we previously picked his other book, The Lives of a Cell, which I read many years ago. This one was published in 1983, so it's quite an old book. And it traces his training as a physician. And you may remember Lewis Thomas ended up being the chancellor of Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. And his Lives of a Cell was a collection of he had written for the New England Journal of Medicine. And this book traces his education as a physician. Very interesting because he went to medical school at a time when medicine was changing and becoming a science and it's his impressions. Very good, very interesting stuff. Highly recommended. The Youngest Science by Lewis Thomas. Of course, if you like to listen to science podcasts, there are other good ones at sciencepodcasters.org and promednetwork.com. TWIV, of course, uh, has a website where you can find all of our show notes, twiv.tv. So go there, and we put links, all the links that we mentioned, and our show notes. Continue to send us your questions. Love getting them. Twiv at twiv.tv by email. You can send us an MP3 file if you'd like, or easy, more easily, perhaps, I have set up a Skype account just for Twiv. It's called Twiv Podcast, one word. You go to skype.com and you call Twiv Podcast, you'll get the voicemail. And you have 10 minutes to state your question, and that will be played on the show. And if you don't want your name played on the show, just give us your first name. Okay, so that's skype.com, TWIV podcast, and you can record your questions for us. You've been listening to This Week in Virology, something different today. Next week, we will be back with the usual interactive format for TWIV. Thanks for joining us. Do subscribe to us on iTunes, and if you don't use iTunes, go to twiv.tv and get all our episodes. See you next week. Another TWIV is viral. Viral.